Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program, who include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Dr. Serge Gauthier, Professor Emeritus formerly of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of donors, and today's webcast is thanks to the Zeller Family Foundation. Today's webcast is a very special one, as well as an emotional one. We will be discussing lessons from the end-of-life journey of one of, of one of Canada's palliative care trailblazers, Cappy Flanders. My guest today is her daughter, Elle Flanders, who along with her sisters, cared for their mother at home until her last breath. Elle Flanders is an award-winning filmmaker, artist, and activist. She has exhibited her work across the globe and together with her partner, architect Tamira Sawatsky, forms a collective duo, Public Studio. She is currently active with the Cappy and Eric Flanders Chair in Palliative Medicine, the McGill University Council on Palliative Care, and is an executive member of the International Congress on Palliative Care. Welcome to McGill Cares, Elle. Thanks, Claire. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for having me. And I hope initializing what is, I know you and my mom talked about this and what I hope is going to be a great collaboration between the McGill Dementia Education Program um, and palliative care. And I think what you've done, what you've built is so important. Um, and my mom told me all about you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think um, it's crucial that these two things intersect and um, I'm just glad to be a part of it. And I also want to say, I know we're gonna talk about this after, but I wanted to say that I know um, uh, we've just installed a new chair in palliative medicine, Dr. Justin Sanders. So together with you and Justin, it feels like we're starting a new chapter. Yeah, it certainly does. And, um, you know, on my journey in the past, I would say almost 20 years now, I mean, there's a few women who have truly had an impact on me and I've looked at them and the work that they've done and really have become my mentor. And I have to say that um, your mother was one of my true mentors. You know, I, I had the privilege of, of meeting her probably in about 2016, but in just a short period of time, she, she really had an impact on me. And um, so your mother established the Council on Palliative Care at McGill University and served for years as its co-chair. For this, she received the Governor General's Meritorious Service Medal in 2003. She remained a tireless volunteer on behalf of the McGill community and in 2009 received an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from McGill. In 2015, she was named a member of the Order of Canada for her work in palliative care. Um, so on June 4th, 2020, I received um, this email from her, which I would say um, completely um, shocked me. Um, just one of those things that happens in life when they say expect the unexpected. So this is the email. I'll just read a little bit of it from it. So she says, dear family and friends, as many of you know, I've been going through a bit of a difficult time recently. I now have, a, I now have clear information and wanted to let you all know where I stand. I have a form of abdominal cancer. We are not 100% sure exactly what because I've refused any more tests or treatment. It's terminal. I have opted for comfort care, which hopefully will give me quality of life for as much future as I have left and known at the present. And then I heard that on June 27th, just, you know, they almost three weeks later that she had passed away. Are you able to share um, a little bit about what happened? I mean, I have to say that sure. this news really shot, stopped me in my tracks because I was not aware that she had been struggling. I mean, your mom was a very, you know, tough, <laughs> energized woman, but please share the journey. Sure. Um, well, I, I think what what's astonishing is if you think of that timeline, June 4th to June 27th, that's 
brief. Um, of course, there was a lead up to that um, that we were all involved with uh, as her children, um, but she really didn't know anything. And I think that in a way it was sudden and in a way it wasn't sudden because my mom had several different cancers <clears throat> over many years. And um, it started in her mid fifties, um, not long after my dad died. And my dad died when he was 59 of lung cancer. And that's kind of how her medical journey began was caring for him. Um, so she had several different kinds of cancer and supposedly one wasn't related to the other, um, but she had been kind of working, she had been um, suffering from a, a, a bladder cancer. Um, that they had said was completely manageable, and it was for many, many years. Um, I have a feeling, um, but because she refused testing, we'll never know, but we have a feeling that there might have been a recurrence of some kind. Um, and so sort of, I would say kind of in November, October, November already, she wasn't well at all. So by the time she wrote that letter to all of you in June, she had lost 40 pounds, um, you know, she, she just really was, was quite weakened, but funnily enough, um, her palliative care doctor said that he thought maybe six months, um, and then it was just a matter of weeks. So I think that that's something we can talk about because I think this whole thing about being able to have an idea of when death will occur is in fact not so much the case and has a huge effect on when we can actually enact palliative care. So, um, but, you know, I think that letter to all of you was part of her advanced care planning. Um, it was part of an acceptance. And at the same time, we can kind of look at it in complicated ways. So she became ill during a pandemic. <laughs> That's already the first complication. Um, she couldn't be seen by her GP. Uh, so much of what was diagnosed was <laughs> over a phone. Um, put that together with somebody <laughs> who doesn't want further intervention, who was somewhat So I have to stop you there. So <laughs> she was given the news that her cancer was terminal over the phone. Like, no, how? that was no. so, um, yes and no, really. I mean, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint, but there were many conversations. Yes, in fact, she was. Actually, she was given that diagnosis over the phone. You're 100% right. And that was with another doctor, not her GP. Um, nobody was seeing anybody, Claire. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just, you know, um, <laughs> we were having yeah. the crisis in old age homes. Um, the hospitals were overflowing. Um, so there was just no contact. And mm -hmm. frankly, she didn't really want contact. So, and this isn't something I'm recommending for everybody. I'm just telling you about her particular, you know, choices. And I think choice is going to be a key piece of our conversation today, I hope, because mm -hmm. I really think that a lot of um, what palliative care is about is, is about giving you choices and making, giving you control back over something that doesn't have a lot of control. So at least in terms of making some last kinds of decisions. Okay. Um, so the question, one of the, sorry, go ahead. One of, what, sorry, one of the questions that I'd like to ask you though, because so here's your mom, you know, leading the council on palliative care for years, leading these conferences on, on, on death and dying. Mm -hmm. How did she react to her own diagnosis? I mean, I look at, you know, if I compare myself to I'm working in the field of dementia care education, you know, and then, you know, I often wonder, like, well, how would I react, right? So and it, should I receive this diagnosis? So how did she, with all the tools, with all the education she had, mm -hmm. how did she respond? I guess I would say that it came in stages. <laughs> um, when they said it was cancer and she refused treatment, she knew she was dying, but it wasn't real. <laughs> and I think that there's sort of, when they said it was six months, for her, it also wasn't particularly real. Um, when it got to the last week, I think things changed drastically because at that point she was thinking about, you know, um, forms of pain. I mean, 
you know, obviously sedation um, and pain relief um, and comfort care, as she said. Um, and I think making that decision to have the comfort care is, I think, when the penny dropped, <laughs> because at that point, it's, you know, it really does reduce two days. So okay. can you explain? Became, so it became very can, compressed. Can you explain what comfort care is, you know, for those people who are watching and may not be familiar with that? Sure. Including not, myself, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not super technical. Um, okay. So please forgive me. And, and I should have said that at the beginning, that what you're getting is um, not my mom. You're getting somebody who's learning about this. Really, even though we know everything for years, you know, when it's your own family and also when you have to get into the nitty gritty, you realize you know nothing. Um, so um, basically what comfort care is, is that it's sort of um, it's when you start to treat pain um, with a, a series of different um, drugs. So it could be morphine. It could be, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are many different kinds of, um, of drugs that become administered and, um, to ease your, to ease your discomfort, um, which at that point she was having a lot of, um, there was a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort. Um, and so as the more you administer the drugs, you, the more you go into, um, uh, sort of sedation, um, and so it was sort so of a, a slower, you know, a sedation that eventually your body just gives out, um, palliative care and made, of course, are quite distinct, um, in the sense that this is a natural process for your body. Um, but it does sort of, um, create a state of, uh, a lot of sleeping, <laughs> So the other question I have is is also, uh, you know, understandably she, you know, she was diagnosed um, during COVID, but mm -hmm. you know, she chose to die at home um, versus being in a hospital. So you know, for those people again watching, and you know, sh should they make the decision to be at home? I mean, how does the healthcare system get involved? Because you know, you're discussing now comfort care. Is there somebody that's going to come to the home and? take, yeah. you know, administer, like, how does that all work? Well, you know, another great question, because <laughs> that was our question. And interestingly mm -hmm. enough, despite everything my mom had done in palliative care, I think the, the process was still somewhat mysterious for her um, in the sense of who talks to whom about what, when, and where. So really, I mean, the process is, is that your GP or your attending physician calls in a palliative care team um, when they think the time is appropriate. The hard thing about that for a family is, and I think is, is that, <laughs> that that's all very dependent on your physician and how attentive they are and how, you know, how much you're asking them to ask for that. Um, so I think for me, one of my great missions would be to unmask the process of palliative care and, you know, so first to make us aware, uh, make us all aware uh, that palliative care even exists. So Claire, you know, you can imagine how few people know about palliative care generally. So almost nobody, right? And you're even you who's, <laughs> you're in, um, in health education, um, you know, you do super high level work and it's a bit of a mystery to you too. So I mm -hmm. think we need um, a national awareness campaign. There is one, mm -hmm. but I would like to, I think that in terms of what I can offer in terms of filmmaking background, communication skills, that we can really start something. So that's the first level. And then I think mm -hmm. the next level is at a much, more kind of um, policy oriented level and then at a level of communication between doctors we need to unravel that a little bit um, mm -hmm. so that it's something that everybody knows about that they can then ask for um, but that's where it gets tricky knowing when to ask and I think the problem is this the problem is for me and so these are all my very personal views. I, I represent no one at this point yeah. other than myself. I give you the caveat because uh, I could be stepping on all sorts of toes that mm -hmm. I don't know about. Um, but again, from personal experience, this, uh, this was our case was that I don't think that 
I think that first of all, palliative care is associated with end of life. And in Canada, palliative care and hospice are almost interchangeable. And in my mind, um, and in many palliative care movements, that's not the case. Palliative care can be an associative care. Palliative care can come along with dementia, which is long-term as we know. Palliative care can come along with a cancer diagnosis that may be terminal, but it may be years. Um, palliative care in my mind and in many other places is about receiving um, comfort and options. And it's about a dialogue. It's about a way of having a conversation about last years, not about, you know, this finite three months, um, which is at the moment how, going back to your question, how it happens. So at the moment, how it happens is your attending physician sort of decides that your sort of end of life, which I think currently means kind of three months, um, mm -hmm. and then you're allowed to call the CLSC. So you call a CLSC, um, and they will send a team over. Now, I want to say once the CLSC is triggered, we have the most incredible system. Like it, it's just, it's, it, it's incredible to witness. Um, and I think that the idea of dying at home is a wonderful idea for those who can. Um, I would love it to be available to many, many more people because mm -hmm. I think the hospital stay is much more traumatic for many people um, who don't necessarily need to be in hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots we can do at home. And once mm -hmm. you've got that CLSC team in place, which includes a social worker and it includes a nurse um, and it includes a consultation with doctors. So we have we have the makings of it. I think it's just a question of the systematizing of it. Um, so I that's think you bring up, like yeah, yeah. You know, you really bring up a good point though about education because, you know, unfortunately, the death is a. Uh, it's like people are afraid, right? And you say the word death and dying, and it's it's just something that we don't want to deal with. And you know, I mean, I work with families all the time who you're right with dementia. There's some things that have to get into place. You have to start planning, you know, for your future and. We just don't want to talk about it until oftentimes a crisis happens. But I think we need to become better educated in the whole process in palliative care. I mean, there's, you know, there's the, because it, unfortunately it will happen to all of us at some point. And, um, and and so there is a big, big education that needs to be made. Um, I want to ask you now, you know, if it, really also how did how did your mother's uh, you know, the, the 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 months leading up to her death and the actual her passing, how did it impact you and your family? Um, well, I think mean, much like you, we were all a bit shocked. I mean, because she was very vibrant um, and she was, you know, strong, clear headed. She didn't give off a sign of anybody who was sort of in decline. And I think that we associate death with decline. Um, and I don't think that that's how it always happens. And I think, uh, you know, I'm thinking about what you just said about education. And, and I, I think the one thing that my mom passed on to all of us, um, at least to me, I'll speak for myself, I guess, um, but was just becoming more comfortable with, she didn't, you know, uh, she always hated, she always used to say, you know, I don't like the term passing because it sounds like you're passing gas. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> You die. Um, we live, we die. We get born into this world and we die. And, you know, I'm not saying it's easy, um, but if we could kind of just say that we understand that this is a process um, and that we have a finite amount of time, first of all, I think it would do wonders for how we live in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I also think, I, I, I think just dealing with your own mortality and this knowledge that we're not going to be here forever is just mm -hmm. so important that will help open us all up. And maybe we'd start thinking about this like I do in my fifties, um, as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, so my mom, my, my mom always said, I've had a good life. And that was always hard for us to hear because we'd say, but you're vibrant and you're only 80. I mean, you're not old by today's standards. Um, so I think that was, I think that was really hard. And I wanted to go back to what you were asking before about how did she deal with it? So how we and how she dealt with it, I think were similar in the sense that um, there's, when I was talking about how it's not real, 
<laughs> and when somebody gives you a diagnosis, it's like my mom was super organized, if you knew anything about her. So she had her body donation organized. She would tell us what her passwords were. She, you know, she, everything was sort of super. She had her advanced care planning. So that's unlike many people. So that's something I highly recommend. Advanced care planning, obviously, um, should be in place. It relieves the family of a huge burden. Um but then there's a whole other layer of psychology. And I think that's what she wasn't prepared for. And that's what we weren't prepared for. And there is no preparation for that. It's just- So when you say, what, so when you say a whole other level of psychology, can you expand on that? Like, yeah, I think, I think accepting, accepting, like knowing death and understanding that you're going to die are just different things. I think personally that the body is, uh, that we're meant to survive. We're like mm -hmm. our body goes into a survival kind of a mode. Um, so I think it fights death. And I think at a certain point, you know, no matter how much you know that this is coming, that this is inevitable, there's a cognitive, you know, um, dysfunction or a, a, a displacement where, you know, I think your body's fighting, even if your mind has accepted something. So I noticed with her um, that that finality, that kind of like, oh, I'm really not going to be here tomorrow, didn't really set in till four days before. And I'm sure that I wouldn't be the first to sort of use that kind of timeline. So I think mm -hmm. things like that are just the process is I, I can't tell you how important it is to go through um, somebody's death. I mean, obviously, you know um, mm -hmm. so much about it in so many ways, but just the process is um, being able to be at home, being able to be in your surroundings, that familiarity, being su surrounded by your loved ones. Like, this is what's human and compassionate and important, and it mm -hmm. teaches you a lot about life. You know, I, um, you know, I, so my, my father passed away in January, 2005 and I was with him. I have no siblings. So I was with him uh, when he passed away at the hospital, he passed away of congestive heart failure. I was not prepared even of like, I had no idea what that was going to look like. And that was very, very, very traumatic to, to, to witness that. And I remember you know being with him until the final moment and you know, and he, he passed away and, and probably like your mom, my father had pre-planned everything. So, but that final moment when he passed away, I remember they were changing the shifts at the hospital and the residents mm -hmm. came in at 7 a.m. and it, it had all happened. And, you know, all of a sudden you get into this do mode of, on a guy, you know, that whole, okay, now the next steps, next steps, you're functioning on adrenaline. And then with my mom, again, I was with her uh, on May 6, 2016, when she passed away, which was a very you know, she died in a, in a long anesthesia cell day, long-term care center, could not let go. She died of, of Alzheimer's disease, but would not let go. Um, you know, it was very traumatic for me to, to also to witness. And I think what we underestimate is the trauma of, of, of witnessing anyone's death, whether it be of a spouse, of a good friend, of a parent, but society basically like where would, there was no support afterwards, right? There was no, you know, basically what I would get the feedback I would get from a lot of people was, oh, you know, they're better off now. And, you know, oh, it's, you know, and for yourself, Claire, it's, you know, it, it's better this way and, you know, less of a burden on you. And, you know, my, it, it has taken me, um, it has taken me almost five years to recognize that, that this was a traumatic experience, not only like witnessing both of their deaths, because mm -hmm. unfortunately, there is no, you know, post-death um, support for people unless you realize you need to go and help me grief support. But it had right. a tremendous impact on me. And so maybe, you know, you can talk a little bit about that. I mean, it was really, I have to say, it was thanks to the palliative care conference that I attended in 2016. There, there, was, a, there was a topic about, you know, post-traumatic a stress disorder really related to caregiving okay and and witnessing death and that was, I had this aha moment realizing oh my god like I had these physical symptoms following my mother's death I had all of this but there was nobody there to support me and tell me that this was normal mm. well now luckily we do have bereavement groups but once again as you say these things are not not clear I think 
What's interesting for me coming from the outside of um, a, a, a medicine, medical world, um, and really coming from my world of film and art and, you know, um, is is to realize that communications is is still really lacking. Communication about all these things that should be so apparent to all of us. How do we receive? I mean, you know, you're doing webcasts and, you know, but how do we receive information? Are these not things that we should know about? Like that that are, you know, <laughs> it's it's sort of part of a labyrinthine process. So if you don't even know the questions to ask, you don't even know, you know, it's not so much where can I find a bereavement group, <laughs> um, but does, what is this thing called bereavement? As you, as you say yourself, it's just like, or even knowing that, you know, after somebody dies, that it's a traumatic event. I mean, you know, if we don't have any of this knowledge, if we don't have in, in the mainstream, um, then we don't even know what to ask for. And I think that that's, that's a really big problem. And those are the kinds of things. I mean, I have to say, I think one of the most successful campaigns I've seen in medicine over many years has been the mental health campaign. Mm -hmm. How many now do we know who now talk about mental health? Um, and why? Because they teamed up with a media company um, and Bell launched the Let's Talk. Um, and you know, it was an unbelievably successful campaign. And I think that those are the kinds of things we need to think about, you know, in terms of the externalizing of information. Um, yeah. These are just basic things. I mean, whole person care, that shouldn't be something, you you know, you, I hope your next question to me is what is whole person care? Um, <laughs> what is whole person care? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, whole person care just sort of in a nutshell and very simply is the idea and it's part of now um, family medicine and it's about thinking about ourselves as holistic in the sense of like I said birth and life um, that we are whole people it's about how we speak about ourselves not we are you know I go to the neurosurgeon and I go to <laughs> you know the cardiac person and then as I get further down <laughs> you know all, all the pieces of our bodies it's it's about who we are holistically and I think that just knowing that and having those kinds of caregivers in our lives and that kind of information would make our travel um, a lot easier and maybe a little less traumatic. Um, you know, when my mom died equally, as you said, you know, and, and you just realized, I mean, I think your trauma was quite different probably than mine because mine was a loss. I think yours was compounded by, you know, years of trying to understand dementia, trying to figure out Alzheimer's, not having any resources whatsoever. And look at me, you know, all of this knowledge around palliative care has helped ease me through a transition in my mom's life. Um, do I well up? Do I get teary? Was the first six months so hard? Absolutely. Was it a devastating, you know, grief stricken loss? Yeah, of course. You know, my world changed. The plates of the tectonic shift happened mm -hmm. of losing your mom. But, you know, I had tools. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, that's what I want to give people. I want to carry on my mom's message. So, so for those people watching who, you know, may be going through this journey or, or in the future, because we all will, what would be some of your most important lessons learned or what advice would you give people? Well, um, don't die in a pandemic would be my first, <laughs> but if you can't help it, <laughs> um, I, I think we need to understand that isolation is probably the most damning um, and the most detrimental thing for anybody. So if, um, if you are uh, near or next to somebody who is dying, you must, must, must help them find community. So you must be their community. There are such things as compassionate communities that are around. So make sure that you're not, um, that you're not isolated. Um, reach out 
Um, you know, uh, I hopefully later you'll put up some in resources around palliative care. Um, there are many, many resources that you can find. There's virtualhospice.ca, um, which is a terrific resource that helps you understand all of the things that you might um, that might be available to you. So that would be the first thing I would say um, is important to do. Um, I think that. We should re obviously, um, if you could, uh, on virtualhospice.ca, you'll find all sorts of stuff about advanced care planning. I think advanced care planning really helps you as a person um, as you're going through these last phases, just kind of settle. It helps you just sort of settle down because you know that you've told people what you would like and how you would like it, um, whether it's about... Um, your funeral, whether it's about, you know, um, what to do with your belongings, whether it's about what to do with your body, um, whether it's just about who you want to talk to towards the end. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think just settle you, um, that give you some comfort, not just, <laughs> we don't need comfort, only um, uh, physical comfort, but we need mental comfort. So I think that calms you a lot. Um, you know, I think we need to understand, we need education, obviously. I think we have this default to extending life at all costs. And I think we really need to think about that. We really need to think as a society, do we always need to extend life at all costs? Um, and is defying death our ultimate goal? Um, how can we find a more comfortable place? Um, are heroic measures always necessary? So I would say to people like trigger and feel that you can ask your GP about um, or your attending physician, just even say, it may not be time for palliative care, but, you know, can you point me to the palliative care team? Can I talk to a social worker? Um, you know, my partner Tamira's mom died um, at 74, just uh, a year before my mom. And it was a much more difficult death. She had mm -hmm. a stroke. Um, she didn't have any advanced care planning. She couldn't speak. She was in the hospital, you know, and at a certain point I said to the family, I said, I really think it would help all of us if we brought a social worker into the room so that we could understand a little bit more about what are our choices you know, how do we put all this together? We're just in crisis mode and we're just trying to, you know, does she need this tube? Does she need this, you know, resection? Like, well, no, mm -hmm. I think that's for doctors. And I think doctors should also be able to open it up and say, I think we need to have a larger family meeting. So I think mm -hmm. those kinds of things are important. Mm -hmm. And I guess for me, ultimately, some of the most important lessons were uh, I've adopted a very political and philosophical position um, about dying as part of living. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think if we can all start to think about that a little bit sooner, and if we can nudge medicine in that direction as well, um, and as I said, to this kind of whole person care, I, I think. I think if we are in the room and we witness death, we'll be a lot less afraid of it. Um, so those are some lessons. Such wise words, Alan. I, I, you know, when I work with families, I always say about, you know, you know education is really our power and our knowledge. And it, I think that if you're always one step ahead, like you say, find out what resources are available, speak to the social worker. But, you know, knowledge is really power. And the more you know, it'll just facilitate the process. So that's really um, very important. So what my last question, which is um, a big one. So okay. how fortunate uh, McGill is for you to be stepping into your mother's shoes now and become very involved with the McGill Council on Palliative Care. And so if you could please just just talk to us a little bit about what resources are available and about your upcoming conference in October, which is going to be virtual. Okay, um, so uh, hopefully what we can do is I can give you some of those resources in terms of links. Um, yes. And if you go on the McGill website, there's the Council of Palliative Care that has lots of links. 
Um, there's virtual hospice, as I mentioned. So there's lots of places to turn to, and I can give you those just in terms yeah. of finding out more. Yeah, and we will be putting a link uh, to all of that on the McGill Dementia Education website as well under the resources section. That's terrific. Thank you. I think that's super important. Um, and then, um, you know, I've said it a couple of times, but I'm, I'm really just starting out. So I'm just, just learning. Um, you know, I think, I think the, what I have to offer is an experience and not so much knowledge yet. Um, and I think those things are different. So what I can tell you is, you know, um, we do have this chair in palliative medicine at McGill. Um, we've just hired a new chair. That was Dr. B um, well, the first chair, of course, was Dr. Balfour Mount. And that's where my mom um, started with palliative care. And, you know, the way she got to palliative care was also experiential because my dad died at 59, as I said, of lung cancer. He had no palliative care. And it was not a quote unquote good death. It was difficult. It was mysterious and painful and uh, a mess. Um, but her mom died only two years later and she was in Jerusalem and she had a palliative care team. And this was all new for my mom. And my mom and my aunt were at her bedside and they learned a lot and they were like, mm -hmm. well, this is a wonderful thing. We should have this in Canada. Um, and so the doctor there said to my mom, but you do have this in Canada. And so she said, we do. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know anything about it. And he said, you have the founding father in Canada of North American palliative care movement. Um, his name is Dr. Balfour Mount and he's at McGill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. how the whole chair came about as my mom came back to Canada um, and called Bal and said, if I didn't know about it, um, I'll bet there are a lot more people who don't know about it. How do we do something? So they established the chair. That was the first step. So since then, we've had Dr. Bernard Lapointe for the past 12 years as the chair. And now we've got a new chair called Dr. Justin Sanders, who's come to us um, from Boston. And he worked with Atul Gawande. Um, now, Atul Gawande wrote the book called Being Mortal, Being Mortal, yeah. um, which is a beautiful book, um, a terrific book by a doctor, very much about whole person care mm -hmm. and about thinking about sort of, you know, mm -hmm. medicine and aging and um, mm -hmm. just sort of how do we how, how do we start to think about people as people and not patients? Um, and mm -hmm. it's a very beautiful book. And so he comes from a very kind of esteemed background at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center, and he's young and full of ideas and excitement. And I think that we sync together really well. So I like to think that what we're going to, that what Justin and I are going to do is start Palliative Care 2.0. Um, so what's this next generation about? So I think we have lots of ideas that we'll be sort of developing in the next little while and hopefully lots of educational kinds of programs. Um, we do have on the, on the McGill Palliative Care website, um, we have a whole new section of news stories and I really recommend that. Devin Phillips has been putting that together and it's super lovely. Um, there are just so many stories that are inspiring, that give you information, that help you connect. They're deeply human. Um, and I think stories are, stories are, you know, my background is obviously storytelling and I think we learn a lot through stories. So, Absolutely. so, so have a look at that. And then lastly, Perfect. of course, you asked me, um, and of course, uh, I'm sorry, it took me so long to get here, but you did ask me about the Congress. So the Congress has been something that's been happening every other year since I think 1976, um, it's one of the most important international meetings that are held in the field of palliative care. I think the last Congress had 1600 participants from over mm -hmm. 60 different countries. Um, but we've had two years of a pandemic. Um, and so that has profoundly affected our communities of care and caregivers and their families. So I think this Congress is going to be aimed at developing content that will allow us to share our experiences and try to integrate all the lessons that we've learned as a beginning place. So I think that's important. That will shift some of the, the thinking around the next Congress. I think some of the topics that we're going to be looking at 
are building communities of care, um, which is really important. Um, compassionate communities and building communities around, as I said, so that people aren't isolated, as we know. This has been one of the biggest problems of the pandemic mm-hmm. is that people have been have died alone. Um, and it's been a massive failure in the system. Um, and this Congress will be held in, in October 2022. October so people, 2022. So, and it's open to everyone, right? Anybody can register for it. And, and for which we will have the link to that, to the link to your Congress Thank website. You. And I really encourage everyone to register for it. Thanks, That's Claire. Great. And I think it is important. I mean, we're going to be talking about palliative care in Aboriginal communities, palliative care for the disenfranchised, which is a major issue. Um, and of course, the relationship between MAID and palliative care. Um, I think creating those bridges is going to be super important. So that's just sort of a taste of what's to come. As you say, nobody really thinks that they want to talk about death and dying, but you'd be surprised that once you start um, this journey, um, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's interesting and fascinating and moving um and it makes the world a a bigger Mm -hmm. place and Mm -hmm. i don't know maybe a smaller place i don't know what i'm trying to say there but (laughs) well um, i'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and and i really look forward to working with you and dr sanders on really enhancing uh and really building a relationship between our two programs because it's so incredibly needed um unfortunately you know, those people that are caring for a loved one with dementia, it is a terminal illness as well. And so I think that the more resources and, and tools that we can give uh, families, the better. So I really look forward to um, really collaborating and working together. So thank Me you for too. being here today. I, I, I hope mm-hmm. what it'll do is kind of give another dimension <laughs> to, I don't mean yeah. to dementia. I don't know if that's sort of, a, I didn't mean that as a pun, but <laughs> yeah. I hope it yeah. sort of expands like what we can do, not just together, but for families, as you say, who are living with this. Yeah. So thank you everyone for watching. Um, This webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. Once again, I would like to sincerely thank the Zeller Family Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a contribution to our program, please visit us at www.mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list to be notified about upcoming episodes of McGill Cares, as well as other important program and resources from us, you can sign up at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching.